students. Welcome back. This is Torres, Elba Bump. How are you? Are you doing okay? Is your family okay? Remember, if you need anything, please send me an email so that I can try to help in some way. So lucky you, you get to hear my voice for another lecture. But the best part is we will be talking about qualitative data, tables, and graphs. Yay! So I wanted to do a quick review. In the first part of the class, we talked about the differences between qualitative data and quantitative data. Qualitative data can also be called categorical data, and it has definite boundaries between outcomes. They describe some characteristic. It can be like games won versus games lost, not the amount of games, but just like a win or a lose, colors of M&Ms, courses that you take, whether something is a hot or cold beverage, being present and absent, there's nothing in between being present and absent. I guess you could be late, but that's still not the same as, as being present or absent. Either you were there or not there. You were late, so you were still there. Being pregnant or not pregnant, passing or failing a class. So that is categorical or qualitative data. The other kind is quantitative data or numerical data. And quantitative data describes an amount, a quantity. Discrete data is based on actual counts, so usually the data can't be subdivided in any meaningful way, so that might be the number of courses. You can't take three and a half courses. You can either take three courses or four courses, but there's not a half a course. The number of children in a, in a house, in a family. The other type of data is continuous data, and this is data that becomes much more precise. It can be expressed as fractional measurements. So, so things like temperature, you will get a decimal for your temperature. The time, if you've ever watched the Olympics, especially like track and field, they will time how fast people run or how long it takes somebody to do something and they break down the minutes into like milliseconds. So time can be continuous data. GPA is also continuous data. If you ever looked at your GPA, you'll look to see that it usually goes all the way out to like maybe the thousands, sometimes even ten thousands. The difference between discrete data and contiguous data is one of them has very clear cut boundaries. Cutting them up just really isn't meaningful. And then also continuous data is data that can just be expressed into very, very small pieces. And that leads to more precision. So now that we've had a chance to just do a quick little review on uh, qualitative and quantitative data, let's talk about the different types of choices we have when we want to display that data for others to be able to interpret. When you're working with qualitative data, you have a choice of how you want to display things. One way is a pictograph, another way is a circle graph, and another way is a bar graph. When it comes to quantitative data, then we can start looking at some of the other graphs like the box whisker, the histogram, box plots, and the line graphs. But let's first start with qualitative data. Qualitative data is kind of something that we start working with when we're very, very little. Can you see my little comment flying around? You might have remembered these from when you were very, very little teachers start working with students as early as kindergarten to start to develop number sense with children by doing things like these bar graphs. They'll maybe make it with like little happy faces. Do you remember these where you would just get like a happy face and you could put it next to the type of fruit that you liked, whether you liked apples, pears, grapes, or bananas, right? And you got a vote for those. And then you would just look to see, okay, which is the most popular fruit? Here people like apples the best, then pears, and then bananas, and then grapes. So grapes got a bum rap. You might also see it in something like this where every one of these apples is worth 10. So there were 10 apples in January sold, and then in February there were 40 apples sold, and then 25 apples were sold in a March, and 20 were sold in April. Really what's being described here is a qualitative feature. Here we have a circle graph where it has broken up into different percentages of what different types of fruit people like. We don't even know how many people are in this, but we know that 20% of the people liked pineapples, and here most of the people liked bananas closely followed by grapes. 
Must be a totally different class than this one. Here we have the same kind of thing. There's, see this space that exists between the two bars? There's a space there because there's a distinct separation between how many people like the thing an apple and the thing an orange. There's not a apple orange. There's nothing in between that combines the two. There's nothing in between between an orange and banana, okay, or a banana and kiwi fruit. These are distinct items that cannot be combined. There's no continuous feature to them. Another way that you can see bar graphs, and this is a bar graph, is like a double bar graph or a triple bar graph where it might show different kinds of um, levels. So maybe day one, day two, day three. So on day one, they sold this much squash and this much, I can't even make that out. What does that say? This much corn, this many carrots, this many lettuce, and this many tomatoes. I don't know what that says. If you know what that says, comment down below. On day two, this is how many they sold of the squash, the whatever, the corn, the carrots, the lettuce, and the tomatoes. And then day three again, okay? So while these, bars are together, really what they're doing is they're just kind of coming together in order to show that they're all under the category of spinach. They're all under the category of corn. We could have moved these around. We could move these labels around at the bottom and maybe put them in alphabetical order so that carrots would be first and then corn and then lettuce and then spinach and then tomatoes. And then I don't, like I said, I don't even know what that is. Comment down below if you do. And it would have mattered here. Same thing as this. We could have put grapes over here. We could have put oranges over here. It really is not important. Okay, because really what it's just doing is it's just describing. Quantitative data, you're gonna start seeing things that are, have an amount. If you're dealing with amounts that are not continuous, that are discrete, you would probably still have a bar graph, but if you have a wide range, or if you have continuous data, you can start to see things in this kind of histogram. And what the histogram does is it includes all values from 20 all the way way up until the very last value until 30 hits and then it and then it starts here and then it com, com, um, combines all the numbers all the values that exist between 30 and 3.999999999 whatever as long as you don't hit 40 it's going to still go into this bin what this is doing is it's combining a larger range here all the way up until the next value Quantitative data can also be sectioned out, can be expressed and described using a box plot. You can also see it in a line graph. So let's first start talking about a bar graph. I like starting with this actually when I'm teaching stuff because I feel like everybody at some point in their life has had some experience with a bar graph and it usually comes very early in life, right? You start to understand that the taller the bar graph, the more there is of that amount. The taller the bar, you have more than something that has a shorter bar, okay? And they're pretty intuitive to read. It doesn't take a whole lot of interpretation. So a bar graph is basically constructed by labeling each category of the data on either the horizontal or the vertical axis, and you start to see how often that feature or that category shows up, and you can also do it relative to the category, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. We're gonna start talking about single and double bar graphs that are gonna be used for categorical data and data that fits distinct groups. This will be important when we start to describe our samples when I give you sample data. So this is really great to describe physical characteristics. So if you're taking notes, which you should be, you wanna write this down that single and double bar graphs, pie charts, if you wanna call them circle graphs even, those describe categories and they are used to describe the physical characteristics of your sample. The purpose that we want to describe the physical characteristics is because we want whoever the reader is to have evidence that our sample matches the characteristics of our population. So here is a bar graph. Here they've decided to go ahead and put in some of the features or the categories here in the y-axis. So here we have Spanish, Mandarin, Hindi and English. These are all languages. And they are counting up apparently, I mean, we don't have a whole lot of reference here, but maybe they're counting up how many people speak this particular language. Here we've got approximately, I don't know, I would say maybe 380 people here. We have another, you know, maybe 390 people here. We have 800 
50 people here and another 300 and something people here. And we have an idea of how many of this group speak each of the various languages. Just by looking at this, you can definitely see what the most frequent language is in terms of the languages spoken in that sample. More people speak Mandarin than any other language in that particular sample. And then the rest of the languages are divided pretty equally, right? Spanish, Hindi, and English are approximately the same. And that's really what you're just kind of looking to, to gauge. How similar are these things? How similar is the data? How different is the data with the bar graph? Here is another simple graph. This time they decided to put the categories on the x-axis and the values or the counts on the y-axis and it has the bar graph shows Mr. Snowden's students by gender and band membership. So there's some kids that are in a band and some kids that are not in the band and for each group there are female and male students. So it will say how many of Mr. Snowden's students are band members. So here's four girls that are in a band and here are three boys that are in a band. So together we know that there's seven students that are in a band. And how many of Mr. Snowden's students are not band members? We can just look here to it says not band members and there are five students. And then there's another six students that are not in a band. So together there are 11 students that are not in a band. So there's 18 students total in his class. You're either in the band or you're not in the band. So there's no sort of in between. You can only fit into one of these categories. They're discrete. You're not able to break them up into something that is more uh, fluid. Again, these bring back warm, fuzzy memories from when you were little, because these are just the kind of things that we do when students are starting to understand like how to count, how to categorize things, how to make simple bar graphs. Here it is just opening up a bag of M&Ms and doing some sort of frequency count. So for brown M&Ms, if you opened up the bag, there's 12, there's 10 yellow, nine red, six orange, three blue, and five green, how will I know how many M&Ms total would there be? Well, I could just add them all up, right? So if I added them up and I got out my little calculator here, let's just add these up. I've got 12 plus 10 plus nine plus six plus three plus five equals, there's 45 M&Ms in the back. We could even do something like figuring out the percentages. If there's 45, we could figure out the percentage, which is what we're going to do here in a minute. So here is a bar graph for the M&M colors. The way that the creator of this graph decided to make them is they just put in brown, yellow, red, orange, blue, green. But if they would have put this in alphabetical order so that it would have been blue, brown, green, orange, red, yellow, taken this thing and moved it around, but it's not going to change these heights at all. It's not going to change the information whatsoever. This is a frequency distribution because it's just showing how often these show up. If I wanted a relative frequency distribution, then I would be looking for a percentage where you just take the frequency divided by the sum of all the frequencies and get a frequency distribution. So let's look to see how they did this. We already counted up how many M&Ms total there was in this 45 M&Ms total. So let me get back to my calculator here. So here they have, there's 12 M&Ms. They're gonna go ahead and divide it by the total amount of M&Ms, which is 45, and get 0 0.2667 if they rounded, which is approximately the same as 26% or 27%. Let's do this one. What did they do here? Here they took 10, the 10, and they divided it by the total. So the total was 45. And they got 0.2222, which is approximately the same as 22%. Let's try the next one. And this would be a great time for you to just open up Google Calculator or you know, use the calculator on your phone and try doing some of these yourselves. What are you gonna put in? Um, well, you're just gonna put in nine. The account is still the same. The count maintains being uh, 45, so you're 9 divided by 45, and you're going to get 0.2. Okay. Same thing is happening here. You have 6 out of the 45, so 6 divided by 45, and you get 
3 divided by 45 and you end up with 0.066. Here they rounded to 7 because it just kept going out to 6s all the way here. So you have approximately 6% or 7% is of the M&Ms are blue. Those are my favorite ones too. And then 5 divided by 45 you have 0 0.1111, approximately 11% are green M&Ms. So that's a relative frequency table. And really the only difference between relative frequency table and a frequency table is the frequency table is just the counts. and It's making the bars with the counts. And the relative frequency table is making the bars with the relative frequency with the percentages. So here, look what I have here. Instead of having frequency, how many, you notice that it has the decimals that represent the percentages. So here's 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, and 30%. And then instead of graphing the amount of, of M&Ms, they graphed the percentage. You still get approximately the same shape, almost identically the same shape because it's relative to one another. Here's a double bar graph. A double bar graph will use to compare two related sets of data. So if I wanted to see how many students came to tutoring during each of the quarters of the year, okay, I just decided to break it down into fall, winter, spring, and summer. And I wanted to see how many students were attending tutoring. And I wanted to say, how about first year students and second year students? So I'm gonna say first year students are blue and second year students are red, okay? And this is for 2018, 2019. So this is fall 2018, winter 2019, spring 2019, summer 2019. The blue is first year students, the red is second year students. I'm able to distinguish between that, those two types of students for the same quarter, right? And I can see at a glance that except for one quarter, the third quarter, my second year students were coming to tutoring much more than the first year students, right? Something happened that third quarter in order to kind of bring attention to this, right? Usually, usually I get 20, 20 to 30 students from the first year coming and that third quarter I had 90 the variability, the differences between the red bars, really there isn't a whole lot of differences. So using the double bar graph can allow me to look at that qualitative data, the quality of what year the student is in and what quarter they were attending tutoring in order for me to describe that to the reader. I don't have to write out a huge paragraph to explain what's happened necessarily. You can kind of glean that from, from the bar graph. Let's look at this table and it says that it shows highway speeds and limits on interstate roads within three states and it has Florida, Texas, and Vermont. Okay so in Florida if they're driving in a rural area so like the country they can go 70 miles an hour and if they're driving in the city they can drive 65 miles an hour. Jeez. In Texas you can go 70 miles an hour regardless of where you are <laughs> apparently and in Vermont you can drive 65 miles an hour in the country. In the city, you need to cut it down to 55. So what has happened here? Well, here, what did they do? They broke it down into Florida, Texas, and Vermont per state. They could have done this in a different order. They could have did Vermont, Texas, Florida, or Vermont, Florida, Texas, or Texas, Florida, Vermont. It could have been in any orders, right? It doesn't really matter. And what they did is for Florida, they put down the uh, 70 miles per hour here for the rural area. And they put down 65 miles an hour for the urban area. So we can see that the blue is going to be the urban and the red is going to be the rural. Texas, you can drive like a fiend, whether you're in the country or in the city, 70 miles an hour, just put the pedal to the metal and go. And then here in the urban area, we can go 55 miles an hour in Vermont and in the rural area, you can go 65. Okay, so the biggest difference exists here. But with even without this, you can look at this table, this contingency table is what they call it, and glean the information. So I'm gonna take a moment and just do 
a sample problem. I'm going to go ahead and use StatCrunch for now, but you can do this on any statistical programming. When I get a minute, I will try to make a video for it on Excel so you can see how you would do this on Excel as well. It's a little bit trickier with Excel, but you don't have to worry about signing up for StatCrunch. Now remember, StatCrunch is an optional program. It's pretty reasonably priced. The information that is showing on this screen right now is of March 2nd, 2021, but definitely go into the description box below and you will find the link and it will show you information about the current pricing. It's a great program, but I want you to know that it's completely optional. You do not have to be registered in any class to access it. So if you're not in my class, you're just watching this video to help you in your own class, you can access StatCrunch for the same price at that link. I have linked some example data in the description box below that I will be using for this example. The example is in a Google Sheet, so it is also available to anybody who views this video. All right, awesome. So here we are. Um, here it is. On, I'm on StatCrunch, and I've also opened up this example spreadsheet that I have. I just want to talk about a little bit about how we can use StatCrunch to make some really great graphs very quickly and easily. Today's focus will be working on qualitative data, and so we're going to make, be making bar charts or pie charts, one or the other. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and open StatCrunch, and it's this yellow button in the center, and you will get this, and it's like a spreadsheet looking thing. Then I'm gonna go ahead and go into our Google Doc, and I'm gonna go ahead and select everything. So you can select everything by clicking this gray box that is underneath the FX symbol right here. I would recommend doing that instead of like dragging to try to select everything because you can sometimes accidentally change the values. It just can get kind of messy. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that and I'm gonna click into where it says VAR1 and see how VAR1 is highlighted and then I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control V, or if you have a Mac, you would hit Command V, and it'll give you the same kind of information. And then it will bring out all your data in through here. Now this is medical data. I will also include the code book so that you know what some of these are. And let's just go through real quick, and I wanna see if we can try to start to identify some of this data. Now we're looking for qualitative data. Qualitative data are things that are a description. A lot of the times for our class, we're gonna be looking for physical description of people, okay? They do not include an amount. They are a physical description, a category. If I'm looking at ID, ID is basically, instead of people putting people's names, they wrote ID. So we're gonna go ahead and forget that for now. An age is a quantity. It describes how many years someone is. Sex has zeros and ones. So let's look at the code book to see what zeros and ones mean for the cytomegalovirus information. So here is my cytomegalovirus code book. And the code book gives me information about what all these little things mean in my, in my data. So here we have uh, the ID is the patient ID. The age is the recipient age, right, in years. And here we have sex. Zero is female and one is male. So if we go back over here to where we have our data, we can say that this first patient is male, this next patient is male, this person is female, this person is female, this person is female, this person is male. And we can look at this information sex, recipient sex, one male, zero female. You can also look at the race of the patient, which is zero African-American, one white. So we can look right here and we can see that this is a male that is African-American. This is male who is white. This is female who is white. Female, that's white. Female, that's white. Male, that's white, and so on. These right here, these ones are not describing a quantity. They are describing a type, whether the person is male or female, whether the person is Caucasian or African-American. Okay, so these definitely are going to be qualitative variables. 
Uh, let's just concentrate on the sex variable. In order to run frequencies for my sex data, I can do this a couple different ways, and we're going to start doing it the most easy way. So, so go here where it says stat, and then go to where it says tables, and then where it says frequency. And I'm going to go ahead and pick the qualitative variable that we just talked about, which is set. Click on that, that's blue, and then the sex variable will pop up over here. And I'm going to go ahead and choose the following. I'm going to choose frequency, relative frequency, and percent of total and go ahead and hit compute and it gives me this table right here now let's see what it gives me here it says that there's 64 people total in my data and that makes sense right let's scroll down and see if I've got 64 people I do I have 64 cases okay 64 cases of those there are 30 that are have the code zero okay so that'd be 30 that are female and 34 that have the code one, so they would be male. So this is female. There are 30 of them. Out of the 64, the relative frequency is 0 0.46, and the percent total is 46.875. Now I want you to look at this number right here, 0 0.46875 and 46.875. What's the difference between the two? If you look really, really carefully, what do you notice? That the decimal point, instead of being right before the four here, is right after the, the six here. It moved over, okay? The reason why is because the relative frequency will use one as the whole, while the percent uses a hundred as a whole. They mean the exact same thing. They're just using the whole in terms of either 100% as your whole or one thing as your whole. Same thing is happening here. For males, we have 34 of the people of the 64 were male. 0 0.53125 is the relative frequency. And if we wanted to write that as a percent, it would be 53.125. I ran into some trouble remembering what zero and one is. I can do something to help me out with that and that is recoding these. Now you can leave it like this, but if you wanna make things a little bit easier for you, you can go through and recode, and you can recode by going to data, and then going all the way down to where it says recode. Okay, and you're gonna to go to sex. And you're going to go ahead, and you can either replace the current column or create a new column, but I'm gonna go ahead and create a new column because I just want you guys to be able to see how these things transformed, they recoded. Let's see, compute. Instead of zero, I want to put female, and instead of one, I want to put male. Where am I getting this? Do you remember where I'm getting this? I'm getting this from the code book. Compute, here it has the recode, Wherever it had male, now it says female. Okay, so I can now go through and make a new table. I want to go to tables, frequency, scroll down to where, where I have my recode for sex, and I want the same things. I want frequency, relative frequency, percent of total, compute, and here it will actually say female and male. Okay, so it's made the frequency table for me. Now let's make a graph. So this time I'm gonna go ahead and make a pie chart with my data. I'm gonna go down to where it says recode sex. And I want it to say I want it to have the percent of the total. So I want the percent to show as a label. I can click compute and here is my information. It's right here. What makes it nice is now that I've saved this, I can actually go in and I can save this or download it as I need to. I can save it with my data here, you know, this is for cytomegalovirus, and save it, and I can always find it in my results folder. So if I wanted to go into my results folder uh, back here, I could go to where it has my results, and it will have my chart right here, and it keeps everything for me. So it makes it really, it really makes it nice, really easy to use. Let's do one more, and this time, Let's work with race. 
Now race has zeros and ones as well. My race is one is white, zero is African American. Let's recode it first this time. This time let's recode first. So I'm gonna go to race. Let's create a new column. Compute, zero was African American and one was white. Now that I've recoded the race and I have it as its own separate column, I can go in and calculate my frequencies. So I'm going to go to stat and then down to tables and then frequency. I'm gonna scroll all the way down to where it says recode race. I'm gonna choose the same one. So frequency, relative frequency, percent of total, compute, and it gives me my information here. Again, I have 64 people in my database here. Six of the 64 were African American, which can be written as a relative frequency is 0.09375. And if I wanna write that as a percentage, it would be 9.375%. 58 of them are white. That would be written as 0.90625 as a relative frequency, and that would be 90.625%. Finally, let's go ahead and make a pie chart. Pie chart with data, I'm gonna go ahead and select the recoded race section right here. And for my labels, so let's see what happens when we, we select both count and percent of total and what that looks like. And here it is. Here it has the majority is white, and then it has this little sliver right here that is the African American patients. And then if you notice here, it'll say African American, comma, six, comma, nine point three eight percent, and white, comma, fifty eight, comma, ninety point sixty three percent. I think it makes it difficult to read because the commas are so tiny and you're dealing with such tiny things that actually, let's just say I decide I don't want the counts in there. Instead of having to make my whole chart again, I can go where it says options and edit and then go in and say, I just want the percent total and compute and it will redo it again. So you have a choice. You can delete it and do the whole thing over or you can just go in and hit the edit option. If you wanted to save it, you can save it in your results area. Pie chart with data. This is race and cytomegalo. And save, again, that would be in your results section and it would show up right here. Go ahead and try doing diagnosis type or diagnosis. I'll let you guys decide. You can either do this column or this column go into the description box and get the cytomegalovirus Google Sheet, copy all the cytomegalovirus information, title it, so I'm gonna, and try to run some of this data. You should be able to do the qualitative data. Qualitative data, you can try to do the sex and race, just like I did, try to do the diagnosis. All of them have a diagnosis of different kinds of, looks like different kinds of cancers. And then the diagnosis type, you could get the diagnosis type information by going into the code book and seeing what the zeros and ones mean and what even the blanks might mean because they might mean something too. So what's the big idea? Today's big idea is that there are two types of data. There's qualitative data, which describes characteristics and quantitative data, which describes amount. Depending on the type of data you're using, you're going to select a graph that is best suited for that purpose. The next big idea is that it's important to describe the characteristics of your sample because you want to provide evidence that that sample truly represents the population that is being addressed in your question. So that's it for today. With that said, don't forget to check your emails, check Blackboard, do your homework, and subscribe to this channel. Even better, hit that notification bell so you know when there are new videos to this course. Okay? This is your teacher, Torres, saying stay safe, and I will be waiting to give you a virtual elbow bump in the next video. Ciao!